So Dr. Graciela Larcón uh, is graduated from Univers Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia and trained at John Hopkins at the University of Alabama at Birmingham uh, Public Health Rheumatology. She's currently Professor Emeritus at both UPCH and University of Alabama, Birmingham. And she was instrumental in creating the Lumina cohort which has singled out the importance of lupus in Hispanic populations in the U.S. She is a member of the SLIC group, advisor of the Lupus Foundation of America, and master of the American College of Rheumatology and PANLAR. In 2011, Dr. Graciela Larcom received the Evelyn Hess Award for her research on lupus. It's a pleasure to have her here, and we will know uh, and uh, learn a lot about her experience with Lumina cohort in the U.S. Uh, buenos dias. Uh, many thanks to you uh, for the introduction, and thanks to the organizer for allowing me to present this data, although some of you may have seen. Uh, I was actually going to try to uh, see what is the most important parts of Lumina I wanted to introduce, but then I saw the title that said Epidemiology in the U.S., so I thought that I will just briefly make a few points about that and then focus on Lumina. So this is um, introduction. Okay, so back uh, in 1974, Fessel pointed out that African Americans uh, actually had a much higher frequency of lupus as, compa excuse me, as compared to the white population. As we can see, one in, uh, one in 245 versus one in 700. So he was the first one that pointed out that this is a very clear difference. And over the subsequent years, we have seen that this d data has borne out. You have the, uh, the African Americans, I mean, here you have a study by Fessel, but uh, here, this is a white and black population. This is primarily a white population, and you have a lower frequency. You have this a mixed population, and then you have the only study that studies the prevalence in the Hispanic population, primarily in Arizona, which actually also reveals a high frequency of lupus in this Hispanic population of the U.S. And then we had this astonishing uh, table from the uh, 19, late 1990s that actually show that in African American women, the, this, the mortality by, for lupus or by lupus due to lupus has increased over the years. And that's actually where that has not been the case for, uh, for, uh, for males uh, either of either um, ethnicity. So this is actually something frightening, but we don't have any data regarding what happens to Hispanics and uh, whether also we have seen or not an increased mortality because there are yet no numbers for this population in the CDC in the United States. Uh, so just trying to gather some epidemiological data, I ask, there are two, on, actually there are more than two ongoing epidemiological studies, but two are mature enough. And actually I got uh, Christina to provide me some data from the uh, Georgia study, and Joe McCune was kind enough to give me some data day before yesterday, actually, so I could complete this information. This is the, the prevalence of lupus in the, U, in the U.S. according to this data. And as we can see, not surprisingly, we are seeing also the same thing, that we have a much lower frequency in men versus women, but then you have this uh, uh, much higher rate in African Americans versus whites. And the same thing happens in the Michigan study. And the numbers you see are very comparable in terms of uh, the prevalence of the disease in the African Americans uh, in both studies. And then we have the data in terms of incidence, and again, you know, it's very remarkable that, excuse me, then these two populations that you're going to see very comparable data in terms of the frequency, the incidence, that's new cases of lupus among the African Americans uh, in these two different uh, states within the United States. And then you see a much lower incidence in the white population. But again, the, only, the, um, uh, the data from Michigan has some numbers for the Hispanics, but they are, have wide confidence intervals because they're relatively few people, and therefore I have chosen not to include them because I was puzzled really by the results. And 
and because of the wide confidence intervals, I decided not to include them because they actually show that the frequency is not as high as I would have expected based on my own experience and the previous work from, a pay, from Arizona is actually densely Hispanic. The other interesting thing that the Michigan study shows actually is the early onset in the African-American population. So you see that as compared uh, to, the, to the whites. And that actually shows or really probably represents the genetic burden that these individuals have in comparison to the white population. And this is in terms of incidence, and now we can see here in terms of prevalence, you know, the much higher prevalence of, of the disease according to the age group in the different uh, ethnicities. So this is just a preamble which I thought was important. But as I said, uh, if, uh, have said before in the past, the U.S. really is a country that has three main ethnic groups. Uh, perhaps a I should add a fourth, but for the point of this talk, I want to, to reference to these three. This is the first is the native population of the Americans, you know, that probably came from Asia and actually uh, through the Strait of Bering and then populated North America, Central America, and later South America. And they probably came in two ways. So this is a native population that Christopher Columbus found when he came and discovered America, quote unquote. And then we have really what happened to the Europeans when they came to, to North America and South America, and they actually kind of divide the pie and uh, conquer the whole continent. And then over the years, or around the 18th and 19th century, we have had the slave uh, uh, route coming from the uh, west part of Africa into North America and South America. And in many cases, the population that came to North America came with a previous station in the Caribbean islands. So came over here and then migrated to North America. And uh, so the result of these uh, population migrations, which have continued to the U.S. through the 20th century, and I, I, we can see really the influx of people from uh, Central America and uh, no, South America into the U.S., the influx from Europe, the influx from Asia, Asia really results in what is being described as a melting pot. Now, what happened to the Hispanics? And actually, as Dr. Catojo mentioned before, the term Hispanic in the U.S. is really a non-racial group. And I, I actually am the opinion, and that's really supported in the literature, that they are not really racial groups within humans. Uh, I will say that 80% of the people here, perhaps 70% are, his, are uh, um, Mestizo, mestizos with variable proportion of Amerindian genes and live in Latin America or North America. The Hispanic population in the U.S. is really defined politically as anyone that speaks or comes from a country that speaks Spanish, which is a very loose definition, as he pointed out then, all those Gladell patients are clearly different, could have been classified as Hispanics if they live in the U.S. So this is really the growth of the Hispanic population in the U.S. And you can see those red uh, areas are really where the population is more densely present. But they are very different. You know, the ones in the tip of the, of the Florida uh, area, uh, the Florida Peninsula, you have, you know, primarily from Cuban origin, whereas the one in, the, in Texas will be right here are really of Mexican ancestry and the ones over here as well in the Los Angeles area. But you can see this is the, somebody has called this the revenge of Montezuma. You know, you can see that they are invading really the country and even in small areas, really small towns that you have never imagined that you will see, you start to see signs, you know, carniceria modelo. You know, just to, just to imply that really the Hispanic population in the U.S. has grown, is the largest growing minority and, uh, and is the largest minority at the present time. And you can see that in the census data by the year 250 or 2050, we expect to be about 102 million Hispanics in the U.S. So if I, it's impossible to summarize in 25 minutes uh, or 20 that is left 
uh, what are the contributions of Lumina. So I have listed four, and I'm going to focus on them only. That's not to say that other contributions may not be important. This is already kind of an uh, absolute oxymoron because we know that. But really, this is data that actually show in a very early way, before the GIGOASs and all that, only using 40 genetic markers that we can see here, the very... Uh, um, variable distribution of ancestral genes in the different ethnic groups. And I want to point it out to you, particularly the two Hispanic groups, the ones from Texas and the one from Puerto Rico, and you will see that the percent of African genes are completely different as are the percent of Amerindian genes in, two, in these two groups. Then the other thing that shows is that the African-American population in the U.S. has a very important proportion of European genes, shown in purple in the figure, and then in the contrary, the, the, the Caucasians also have an important proportion of African genes and Amerindian genes. So it's really uh, important to consider this when we study patients in the U.S. or anywhere else for that matter. So the recognition of the severity of lupus among U.S. Hispanics, I think, is actually one of our main contributions to the literature, uh, especially if, those, if those, those patients have a large Amerindian ancestry. And here what I show is a table of the three main groups, Hispanics, African-American, Caucasians. But please note that the, African, the Hispanics are divided into those from Texas and those from Puerto Rico. And the reason for that is the graph, the bar graph that I just show you, sh indicating really that they are di very different in many regards from the, from the uh, genetic point of view. But they are also different in the, in the clinical manifestations of lupus. For example, here you have that the ones from Texas that are primarily of much higher Amerindian ancestry have a much larger proportion of acute onset disease, uh, much higher proportion of renal disease, higher disease activity, and higher damage accumulation. In terms of what predicts the accrual of damage in patients with lupus, we have also shown that patients of Hispanic ethnicity are of, of that's a very important contributor. I'm not saying that is the only contributor, but you can see from this regression analysis that there are many other variables that are important, but at least in our studies, being of uh, Hispanic, primarily from Texas, with a heavy Amerindian component really predisposes you to uh, accrue damage much more rapidly. And this can be seen even better in this uh, Kaplan-Meier survival graph. And we can see and show it in, in red. I'm sorry. As we can see uh, in that graph, you know, the green bar represents the Hispanics from Texas. And I'm pointing out that they really accrue damage more rapidly. So the survival curve tends to actually drop uh, initially. Now, in addition, uh, to that, we have seen that the, uh, this is a regression from that study, and I don't want to spend more time actually on that. <laughs> um, the second important thing is in addition to ethnicity as an important variable in some of the outcomes study, that we have the socioeconomic factors are tremendously important, and we can see that in the following few slides. This is a um, study in which we try to, to determine what is the contribution or the factors that predispose to disease activity. And only to point out that patients do fluctuate, and then instead of studying patients, we study periods of disease activity being high or low, and this is what I have shown in the graph. And then, as we can see here in this, in this table, and uh, not only Hispanic ethnicity and African-American ethnicity are contributing factors to the persistent disease activity over time, but also the purely socioeconomic, the, fa the lack of health insurance, the, the fact that the patients don't cope with the disease properly, or the lack of social support. And that's actually uh, a, very important, a very important finding. Now, back in, before Lumina, in our previous life, uh, Dr. Ravel uh, promoted the study of lupus when he was at UAB. And at that time, we were really not very sophisticated. It was what we would call a historical study based on chart review. And in that study, which was published in 1990, we, ho we showed that being of African-American ethnicity actually was a predisposing factor to uh, early mortality. Now, 
if we look at the Kaplan-Meier data from the Lumin study, we're going also to see, as shown with the red arrow, that you have uh, African-Americans and Hispanic from Texas tend to diet more rapidly. However, when you adjust for the socioeconomic factors, and in our study that was poverty, and poverty was defined as being below the federal level uh, of poverty, then poverty is really the significant factor. And this was done when our cohort was about five years old, and there were 34 patients who have died from the entire cohort. And now, this, is, this analysis was repeated uh, 12 years into the, into the cohort, and we have had 75 deaths. And, uh, and we see here that ethnicity, you see, you have no p-value to, uh, to the right of the, of, the, of the table, but you have poverty really as being a very important variable. I'm not saying that's the only variable, I'm saying it's one important variable. And in fact, in another analysis that I'm not showing, to actually show the importance of renal damage predisposing to, to mortality, you have to really eliminate altogether the poverty variable to actually be able to show the importance of having end stage renal disease as a contributor to early mortality in lupus patients. Now, this is not really uh, surprising because we have seen this is uh, from, I believe, was from an abstract published two years ago by the group uh, from Michigan, actually showing that those patients in the lowest quartile of the distribution of the socioeconomic status actually also show a, a, an earlier mortality than the other patients. Uh, the last point I want to emphasize is the protective role of antimalarials in terms of damage, accrual, and mortality. And actually, this study was done by one of our um, um, investigators at UAB uh, who came with the idea of examining that. And uh, this is really a simple graph that shows uh, the odds ratio of having damage and, and not only total damage, as it's shown in the column called SDI, but also in the different domains of the damage index. And as we can see in this graph, the, uh, all of them are below one, which is the odds ratio, but the ones that are significant are the ones that I'm really pointing at the present time. So you have those. Uh, when this data was presented uh, back in 2001 uh, at the, one of the ACRs, uh, of course, we were told, yeah, of course, that's, that's happening because the patients that are treated with antimalarials are having less disease activity. So we went back and examined the data. This is what is called confounding by indication. Mild disease, you treat them with hydroxychloroquine, less damage. More severe disease, you treat them more aggressively, they develop more damage. And it's not really that hydroxychloroquine is protective. So we went ahead and did what is called propensity score analysis, which is a way to compensate for the difference in the patients that are treated and not treated with hydroxychloroquine. And what happened is now that we see a propensity score being significant, but hydroxychloroquine remains significant, and more so if the patients had no damage to begin with, as shown in the last row of this table. And this was published in 2005. We have also shown that it is, uh, is um, protective of a specific damage, and this is one of the uh, graphs from one of our works showing that patients that have lupus nephritis and are maintained on hydroxychloroquine are less likely to develop any stage renal disease, uh, shown in red, as compared to those that are not treated with hydroxychloroquine, as shown in the graph in black. And this is a result from the regression. As we can see in the reduced model, being on a hydroxychloroquine is protective of the development of end-stage renal disease. So <coughs> <coughs> Lastly, I want to point out to the data on survival. And uh, uh, Luis Catojo has already alluded to the fact that they had the data before ours. And I'm not going to argue with it because actually I saw the graph when it was presented at the Panlar meeting in 2006. And by that time, we were actually working on this. And I remember actually coming to Bernardo and, and telling him, you know, you are sitting on a mile, on a mine of gold, you know, you really need to publish this. And he said, well, let me wait. And I said, let's not wait, you know, I said, let's just, uh, try to get all these papers together. We're working on ours. Guillermo Ruiz Torsa from Spain was working on his data. 
and uh, was really a, a collaborative effort. And that was my first really time that I started uh, trying to um, uh, I was admitted as a Gladell honorary member and tried to help them, help them to get some of their data together. And it's been a pleasure to do that. And as I, uh, Luis said, you know, you don't know what you get into when you start working with Bernardo. Um, so to prove that beyond any doubt, we decided to do a case control study within our own Lumina cohort. So a, page, a case was a disease patient, a control was a, survi a surviving patient that was matched for disease duration. And then we measured the exposure to, to the hydroxychloroquine prior to the endpoint. So this is the design, uh, patient number one, patient number two, this is a, a surviving patient, patient number three. And you can see that the follow-up for these patients is different. So what we did is to adjust for disease duration. This is the exposure to hydroxychloroquine, and then we cut this so the adjustment for disease duration took place. So in the, when we did the analysis, also using propensity score analysis, then we found that hydroxychloroquine was also protective, as it was, of course, the propensity score, which adjusts for the variability between, or the difference between the patients on hydroxychloroquine and the patients not on hydroxychloroquine. So in conclusion, there are no published data on the actual prevalence and incidence of lupus among the U.S. Hispanics. Uh, there are two ongoing epidemiological studies in, in areas with a high density of Hispanics in California, but I spoke with Dr. Jesdani from UCSF just before when I was preparing this talk, and she uh, told me that the data may be coming later in the year. They actually don't have data yet. And the only data I have is the one that Joe McCune was kind enough to um, share with me a couple of days ago, but I don't think that actually um, the estimates are not reliable enough to actually consider that that's the national data. Uh, Hispanics in the U.S. Uh, or people originally from a Spanish-speaking country are the largest and the most rapidly growing minority and a very heterogeneous population. And the point I want to make and emphasize is that a very variable proportion of Amerindian genes. And Dr. Marta Alarcon and colleagues from all over the world have shown the importance of the Amerindian genes, not only predisposing to lupus, but also predisposing to bad lupus. So I think that's a tremendous importance because it has applications beyond the U.S. It has applications to the population of the uh, of, the lat of the entire Latin American uh, countries uh, because they also have very, a very mestizo population. Lumina, I don't consider to be a, 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 a really and truly epidemiological descriptive study, but nevertheless, we have made important contributions to the literature. And for this talk, I have emphasized only three. One is the severity of lupus among the Hispanics, particularly those with a large Amerindian ancestral gene component. Second, the importance of the socioeconomic factors uh, to the course and outcome of lupus. And third, the recognition of, of the protective role of anti-malarials in terms of damage accrual and also of mortality. These studies could not have been done without the support from the NIH, our own institutions, and I want to point out uh, the, that Panlar actually supported a couple of our fellows and also the Stellar Foundation, or the Stellar Program that allowed the training of Latin American fellows under uh, my, my supervision, and they were the, really the motor behind the success of the Lumina study. Uh, Ravel and Villa uh, were our collaborative PIs in this study. This is a picture from 1995, and over the years we have been lucky enough to be able to present our data and different venues. Uh, this is a graduation for one of our fellows that you may recognize him. And uh, this is another picture from another ACR. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Graciela Larcón. Uh, so we have uh, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes for questions. So uh, please come to the microphones. Uh, if somebody have questions.
Dr. Jara from Mexico. Uh, congratulations for the excellent presentations. Uh, I think that um, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus is the same disease in all the world, but there are differences uh, between different populations. Um, in this regard, my question is uh, about the profile of autoantibodies in Latin American people versus U European people or other, other um, populations, including the United States. Do you have evidence about the, the profile of autoantibodies in different populations? That was one of the original projects. Unfortunately, we have some zero collected, but we still haven't analyzed it in a central laboratory, so we didn't want to show that data because what we do have is the standard routine laboratory of each center, which is maybe not, not that reliable for this kind of analysis. So I, the answer is we don't know. In the, in the Lumina study, uh, we have seen, for example, an increased frequency of anti-Smith and anti-DNA antibodies among the African-Americans. Among the Hispanics, it's primarily anti-DNA, uh, which uh, correlates highly with the high frequency of renal disease among those patients. And in the Caucasians, what you see more is anti-Rho and anti-La, which correlates also with the more increased frequency of the skin manifestations in those patients. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't choose to emphasize that because uh, of the time constraints, but I'm happy to. Schofield, Oklahoma City, USA. Graciela, what's your final conclusion about Amerindian and Hispanic heritage and socioeconomic status? Is there a biologic difference to do that's unrelated to to heritage such that those of Amerindian or Hispanic status do worse. I was thinking, the poor whites do as badly as poor Hispanics in uh, American Hispanics? Well, there is no doubt that in the U.S. at least, there is a tight correlation between being Hispanic and being uh, poor. Uh, however, uh, and sometimes it's very hard to tease this out. However, I think my conclusion, and I have, like I said, it's impossible to present all the data, is that at the beginning, really, the, the ancestry has more importance in the development of the disease. But over the course of the disease, the course is modulated mainly not by genes, but also but by socioeconomic status. And I'm not saying that it doesn't play any role, because we know that, for example, uh, they tend to develop lupus nephritis more often. Uh, but over the course of the disease, it seems to me that socioeconomic factors are more important. And that's really clearly shown in the, in the mortality data. You know, yeah. if you don't put the socioeconomic factor, then ethnicity is right there. You know, the, the racial ethnic group is right there. Once you include that, and that's been shown not just in Lumina, but also is shown in the data from, for example, the Hopkins lupus cohort. And she used, uh, I believe that uh, Michelle used education as the proxy for socioeconomic status. But if you include one variable of that nature along the, the ethnic racial group, then you're going to see that that is a very important variable. Now, the combination, if you have two factors which really are detrimental, their combination yeah. is pretty bad. So I think that that accounts for the outcomes that we observe among this, this group of patients. And I, I think Michelle has also divided her patients as a proxy for poverty into have health care insurance through a job and don't. And that's really something unique to the United States, for better or for worse. But, uh, but that also divides you quite nicely. If you have access to care, you do well. If you don't, you do badly. Well, Dr. Yelling showed yesterday very interesting data that actually if you are poor but live in a neighborhood right. which is not poor, you do better. So it's really not just uh, if you are poor and live in a very poor area, it's really compounding, a compounding effect. So there is no question that over the course of the disease, that is a very important factor. Um, it's not just access to care. You may actually be able to access care and then maybe you don't comply with care. You cannot right. really get your medication. So it's really not easy to sort this out. But I, I sincerely believe from the data that we have shown uh, we, uh, over the years that both are important 
more at the beginning the genes and more over the course of the disease the socioeconomic factors. And, and maybe synergistic, both important and maybe somehow synergistic. Very nice. Any other question or comments? Uh, I have a question for um, Dr. Cervera. Um, I mean, I think we already uh, pointed out the audience and the speakers about how difficult it is to tease out the um, genetic versus um, socioeconomical factors and access to care, since in Europe, um, the, I mean, it's a, it's a different environment from uh, the health system in general, um, and also the population probably is more homogeneous than what we have in the U.S. and Latin America. I would like if you want to comment about this uh, topic. Yeah, really, I am very happy to comment on, on this. In fact, I wanted also to, to add uh, something to what uh, uh, Chela said before, really. Uh, we think that the, 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 the genes really are, are uh, important, and this uh, we can see in Europe, where probably the socioeconomic differences are not as probably as big as can be in the States or in Latin America because of the uh, uh, health care in, in Europe and also to the access of the, to the education and to the social uh, uh, resources are universal, are, are at least uh, till now maybe things will change, unfortunately, because of the financial crisis. But certainly, uh, and also now we are seeing uh, a lot of immigration from these countries. In, uh, for instance, in, in Spain, we have now a lot of, uh, in Catalonia, for instance, approximately 20% of the, of the people are, uh, have just uh, arrived in the last 10 years, and a big amount of these patients came from Latin America. So now in our clinics, I have several, uh, every day, several patients from Latin America. And they can have uh, exactly the same access to, to health care and to take the same drugs, even biologics, than the rest of the, let's say, white Caucasians, native Catalans in, in Barcelona. And what we see is that uh, when they come to us, they have probably a higher prevalence of renal disease. The renal disease is probably more severe than in the native population. But once they start with therapy, they probably have a similar behavior than the, 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 let's say, the native white Caucasian population. So really, I think that this is a way, probably we have to do this in a more proper uh, statistical way, and in the future we hope that we will be able to do, but this is a way to confirm that the genes certainly make differences in prevalence of the different clinical manifestations, also in the severity of these clinical manifestations, but then if you manage to have a universal health care and social uh, 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 possibilities to, to everybody, then you manage probably to modulate these uh, problems due to the genes. Thank you. Any other questions or, or comments? Okay, we want to thank our speakers for the great presentation and all of you for attending this seminar. Thank you very much. <laughs>